Um, that was quite a harrowing story. So, so if we just want to sit for a, a second just to take that in. But partly what's really important about hearing from Judith and equally from the research that Savon's talking about is the importance of actually taking on these lessons from many different programs in different applications to improve our practice and it's ongoing and it's evolving and that's something to always give consideration to. I have the um, privilege of working uh, across many different programs, uh, working in different contexts and with different practitioners and people that cause harm, people that have been harmed and their communities of care. And m my presentation is really an overview of, of that work and making sense of what is this thing that we call restorative justice practices and the like. The terminology in, in, in the work that I do with others is really to talk about, because restorative has got so many different connotations, to talk about this notion of setting relations right. Because as we've heard, when people are harmed and equally have been harming, uh, there are there are a lot of things that, a lot of relations uh, to set right. And often it starts with the person themselves. You know, people say people shouldn't feel a sense of shame or, or the like, but uh, victim survivors do. And um, so too people that have caused harm, but not always. And we have to work uh, with where people are at. I just want to also recognise and acknowledge the great conveners that are in front from the RJ unit and uh, acknowledge their wisdom and so they're the people to ask questions uh, about some of this stuff later as well after the session. But as mentioned um, by Savon, and I'll sort of weave in things that have been mentioned in the cross both of the pre presentations, there are key lessons from the whatever we call the processes offered because it obviously wasn't in Rwanda called restorative and that's fine, doesn't but processes by which we're assisting in, in this area to set relations right, and, and whether it's at a structural level, in, t in terms of a state level, whether it's a community level, um, because there were more things to be done other than just what, you know, uh, what was happening in that court, or beyond. We need to, we, we've drawn on lessons from programs in many different places to make sense of some of the work that we're doing today. So I just want to note that, and we're standing before many people that have assisted with these lessons. Um, we, we know we require nuanced, tailored responses or processes to address multiple uh, case types described as sexual harm and sexual violence. And I'll get to that in a sec. So whether it's acts of unethical harm and behaviour that we see in schools or we see in universities and in residential colleges, we have to be able to address that all in workplaces where things, are, people, something's happened, people have, uh, know something's happened, but it's not, it would never necessarily be understood as a, a criminal act and we have to still engage with those things and, and where there's harm that's been caused. As well as acts of violence and what we've heard, one off, ongoing, predatory or systematic. So, you know, that's what we're, we're having to respond to. With a variety of programs, and often these, and I'll get to this in a minute, but there's a mix of, of what we mean by program, a process, set of principles, and, you know, how we're bringing people together, we want to talk to that. But in different contexts to address harm and promote, and actually do more than just address the harm, do something about having healthy sexual you know, relationships as, as, as well as ways of relating. A set of shared principles and ways of working across service providers, working with those harm, those causing harm, their communities of care, support and community of professionals. We actually are all wanting to do the best we can and we need ways to do that. So systems to improve systems, to support decision-making processes where people uh, who are affected by decisions about them are participating just and fair, whatever that might mean for different participants and that are healing. So sometimes we talk about this notion of justice and care should always be linked and, uh, and so they should. Case types in the justice context, you know, and talking to the RJ unit, but of course across um, different programs in Australia and elsewhere, we've got a, a range of different case types 
from intimate partner violence and same-sex, heterosexual, long-term, short-term, casual, image-based abuse, familiar abuse, all the different members of a family that can be affected, social networks um, within schools and universities and, and workplaces and the like, and stranger acquaintances. And I think one of the cases mentioned, you know, where it was a delivery person that had, had caused harm in a situation. So there's complexity in the kinds of issue, in harms that we're talking about. And so our responses need to be as complex and nuanced for the case types that we're talking about and the people that are involved. So in terms of the justice context, and the language of the RJ unit is person harm. You know, some of what has been described as motivating a person that has been harmed to volunteer to participate in that process as such is to fulfil a moral duty and often to ensure that the person responsible understands, doesn't do it again, learns from the situation and ultimately changes because it's this moral duty of this has happened to me, I don't want this to happen to anybody else and so how can I be you know, involved in that somehow, because it takes this other person that's caused harm to learn the lessons. And that's ultimately why some, often people come forward. They want that person to learn the lesson, either the person or the institution in which harm's been caused. They want to convey their experiences, thoughts, feelings, whatever that might be in the impact, and, and reflect and often pass on a message. They want to inquire by asking questions and finding out more information. Sometimes there's gaps in their experiences. It may have been they were intoxicated, they didn't know they were young, and things that, that have perturbed them about what has happened, they want to have some answers. And sometimes the person that's responsible is the one that's got those answers. They want to set relations right within themselves, between people, and among groups, it's not just the, the person that's caused harm that they want to set relationships right. It's with other people that, that may have known about a situation or have been affected by the situation. And in a sense, we often just think about it's one group meeting, but it may need to be several to set relations right with a whole lot of people. And that's what we should be offering people, not just a one-off. Person responsible may be motivated because it's the right thing to do. It could be the least of bad option. And it can be an opportunity to understand what's happened, address past harm and troubles, and potentially change. Now, wherever we get someone, um, and whether in this case in the justice system, even if they're just doing it for the least bad option, it's in that we've got them engaged potentially linked with services, potentially having to meet the person that they've caused harm, that is a very useful moment. And potentially, it can lead somewhere good. I say potentially. Case types in the community context. So I mean here restorative process options in education, a workplace as residential, and familiar communities. So, you know, I might go into schools or universities or workplaces where things have, have happened. Um, because people are not going to go to the police. They've got that as an option. They may have reported it. They know that there's not enough evidence, but they still want to address the harm and they want to set relations right. And how can we adapt a process and be flexible in order to meet those pe person's needs? So all the same type of a case types that I've mentioned in, this, in the uh, justice setting, but of course also institutional uh, abuse, both historic and or current. And in that case, uh, we started here with the, uh, the defence, with the Defence Abuse Task Force, National Redress Scheme. In Victoria, we're working through the um, VicPol uh, Redress Scheme, and that's with both historic and current um, cases. I won't really have the chance today to talk to that, but I'm more than happy to talk to people afterwards. So the authorising environment, um, you know, it's not either or, and it's generally it's both and. So that's the level of sophistication and nuance we need. So how can we have, you know, as one of a series or sequence of processes and an integrated intervention, including reporting, formal uh, investigations and the like, how we can have schemes or specific programs to address, address uh, institutional abuse or betrayal? What are the sorts of standards? The criminal justice system has, you know, um, beyond reasonable doubt, the civil uh, area has plausibility, and in some of the redress schemes, a, a kind of a different standard of plausibility, 
was uh, uh, introduced. And that sort of meant the appearance of, of reasonableness. And that's worked very effectively for people to come forward. So uh, we can work with that. We can work with people that aren't always admitting that they've done things as well. Referral pathways can come from where it doesn't matter, self, um, any group. In some senses, we need more open referral pathways, but with the first question that was asked before, we need to make sure that, that, that those referral pathways or the way that people um, introduce this process does no cause, doesn't cause any further harm. So we've got to be sophisticated in the way that we introduce what's possible to who and how. And um, the process addressing individual matters, but also problematic, and you can't see under there, cultures. <laughs> So, you know, structural aspects that we want to do, whether it's at a state level or within an institution or within a family or within a workplace or within a school, wherever it is, you know, we might be addressing the particular needs, but there might be other issues that need to be followed up and we need to be addressing that too. I'm just flagging this. There's a lot of information on the slide, but we don't just have one way of talking, meaning we don't have one way of bringing people together to be able to tell the narration or the incidents that they want to re revisit. We have in the first column the, uh, a single incident or multiple incidents of undisputed harm. Predominantly that's what we see in the justice sit sit setting, which is what the RJ unit ultimately has. The court has particular needs, so they need to make sure that that group deals with the incident that has brought the people before the court, and there's good reasons for that. But we also need to deal where there's a pattern of behaviour in a family or in a workplace, and so we need a different structure for that. And the last, I'll go to the last um, column in terms of the legacy of betrayal trauma in an institution, including in families, and in post-sentencing situations where a young person wants to meet a person that's um, a, a parent that has um, abused them. We use this structure in terms of how we bring people together. So, it's, so there's different ways in which people talk, and there's different structures in which we do that. There's different way, who, it depends on who wants, who want, what story is being told and what's the best order for that sequence of issues to be told. In general, uh, the process that we're calling group co conferencing, uh, and it, there, it applies differently, so that with all the different formats to it, as a, a definition broadly, it, it's to, it can expand the network of people who provide insight, support and oversight. There are people in the room that are not only supporting people that have been harmed or caused harm, there's people in the room that are providing situa insight into the situation. So that could be the counsellor, it could be other family members or people in the workplace that saw things, heard things or, and the like that need to be there or professionals that are giving description to something, especially in schools and universities, where people haven't necessarily seen it as violence. We want it, the lessons to be learned to be articulated. And then we also, as was described, we need people in the room whenever there's any agreement that there's going to be follow-up and the right people there to follow up. Yeah? We want to involve a network of people in what was called truth-telling and sense-making. And, of course, there's different ways in which truth can be told. But there's something about making sure that we revisit the incidents that people need to revisit and agree to revisit in a particular way and make sense about what people have talked through, which links in to people that are working in the narrative field. It's very much a narrative structure in that sense. And then we also, we get people to what's, ha what's happened, uh, the, the impact of, of the situation, where they are now, but where is it that they want to go and how might they get there? Now, there's no surprises about a process that, uh, when a person comes into it. There's a lot of preparation and so there should be. And it means that people are prepared but m more so ready to participate. And that's key as well. So that through, through the truth-telling, we, we call this language transforming conflict into co cooperation because people are generally, before they engage in this, they are conflicted <laughs> within themselves with, between others and between many people. And there is a lot of um, negative emotion, feeling, that people carry. 
And in effect, if we do this right, we can shift those negative affects into um, more positive affects because we're doing something beneficial. <laughs> Not just telling the story to tell the story, we're doing something with it. And people are part of not only describing what it is, but also what it can look like for them and as to where they're wanting to go next and what the outcomes can be. So we're harnessing the cooperation of the people in the room to develop. There's always a, a pragmatic plan. It's not just about telling the story. There's a plan that comes out of these meetings to respond uh, with authority to harm, to prevent further harm and what that might look like. And so these are the questions that, that would be addressed in that meeting and, pro and importantly promote wellbeing. But also to coordinate community and official resources to provide ongoing support and oversight. And that's key. So how can we coordinate what we're doing? This is just a, a way of simply seeing that what we're doing in all of those four formats are being able to describe the scenes of whatever the people are agreeing to revisit. And in the justice system, there's already what we know we're going to revisit. In other situations, we have to discuss that, reflect on the lessons, the, um, draw on the issues to address, options to generate, and actions to address them. So the tailored process is tailored a program to a case. You know, at the moment we've got the RJ unit and it's running under a legislative framework and so there's certain requirements and we'll get to that. But ultimately in time to, new, to create the nuanced tailored programs, we need to con consideration to how, from the lessons from the unit, how we can uh, ensure that not only that the, all the interactions in the process can be therapeutic, because we've got people that go through the preparation that will say, I feel better in being able to make sense of what's happened to me than before I've had the preparation meeting. So all action interactions need to, to be helpful. A facilitated group meeting is to set relations right, maybe part of a sequence of meetings and possibly with a different mix of participants. And that's important too. It's a bit like what you were talking about. How could have we got some of those community members in a second meeting actually to address some of the shame in the community? Yeah. And we need to deal with people's readiness to participate, which will vary, and we know that, and that's okay. And we know that effectiveness is increased in involving communities of care. Because when people are involved in this process with people that matter to them, it matters more. <laughs> Conceptual confusion in this area is that often the phrase restorative justice continues to be used as either a catch-all principle um, and or the name for a process. And in a sense, it limits an understanding that facilitated processes can respond to the bad, but also prevent it and promote the good. So we don't want so many, you know, we, we want the option. Again, it's not a either or. We want to have people that are convicted of violence being convicted. And then it doesn't stop that people should also have the opportunity when it's right in the justice system to meet that person if they cho so choose to do that at any time. So when they're incarcerated or just before that they're released back into the community and this is on offer and has been and to, to good success. But we also want to promote the good and, and do that in a way that uh, we're learning lessons and deliver these uh, healing and justice and educational set of settings but also deliver social justice in many contexts by offering a system for managing relations in community. That's key. So, restorative processes afford an opportunity uh, for people affected by conflict arising from social harm to work with others to address harm, rather than imposing an outcome. Authorities can provide a process. And often that's the underdone bit. There's a lot about what we should do, but how do we go about doing it? And there's, you know, again, a lot of really important insight and we need to collate it across services and the like. That process enables uh, the people who have been affected to seek all these same things that the structure of the group conference attends to. So we're pretty strict in terms of the work that we do in the Association for Restorative Justice and the training and training 
uh, and mentoring facilitators and also talking to different service providers that the restorative justice term is best used for the justice context and it's often referred uh, the process to, by police courts and corrections and as described by Savon, you know, it can be from diversion to sentencing support, it can be post-sentencing and it can be pre-release. Now not all um, states in Australia have these programs and they don't always necessarily talk to each other even if they do <laughs> and yet they need to um, because as I said, a, a person that's been harmed may not want to meet the person that's caused harm at the sentencing stage, but they might afterwards. And I certainly, a case study, if I can get to it, was a, a young woman who wanted to meet her father, hadn't seen him for seven years, but she, he, she knew that he was going to come up for parole. She wanted to meet him in prison. So we did it, although we didn't have a program in Victoria, that is. So just the clarity is, let's be clear of the, what we mean by model. And so it's a set of principles in a justice setting. It's a program that provides sentencing support like the RJ unit does and, and potentially other, um, uh, at other times in the justice system as well, using the group conference process. And there's different ways that, uh, that might be being able to be used. And it kind of looks like that for, for people that don't know. So depending on legislation in different states, certain people must attend and, and others are invited to attend. I won't go into the details. You've got people here you can ask. So why we retribute justice, we know it's a form of punishment. Restorative justice is, ten, the definition is generally working with through negotiation to set relations right. But what do we mean by setting and resetting a relationship between people? It can mean that it's restored if they had a relationship to something better, or it can be deepened. That certainly happens in certain um, relationships in families or siblings or, or friendship groups. But it can simply mean that it no longer involves intense conflict. And so it becomes neutralised for the person. Because I remember uh, talking with a woman whose husband was murdered in a botched uh, robbery and she wanted to meet the man in prison, which uh, we arranged and did. It was about, new, this man was a part of her life. She didn't want him to, to be a part of his, her life, but he was. But he was also the person that knew what happened in the last moments of her husband's death. And she wanted to know what happened. So, that, so it can mean that there's a neutralising of the conflict that a person has. That's setting relations right too, which is useful. Or it could mean that a relationship formally ends. Or it can mean that it's established. That if it's to be established, it's, there's different rules of engagement. Or re-established and say that young woman that I was mentioning who wanted to meet her father, like the rules of and the boundaries are established because they were broken and breached by his behaviour. So why do we punish? I'm just going to... We, everyone here, should, we've got different theories on it, but basically I'm just going to go through these things. The moral balance, you'll pay for it, which is what we heard in Rwanda. Individual deterrence, that'll teach you. General deterrence, this should be a lesson to all or to exercise a power of, you know, responsibly acting on something that's happened, which, which we should. And yet all of those things are legitimate, all of them and should continue, and yet there are other ways too that we need to heal the harm. Despite someone going through a court case and someone being convicted, doesn't mean they're not conflicted still. Doesn't mean that the harm that's been caused has necessarily um, been healed. So some people have greater justice or different types of justice needs that we need to actually address. Or to support individuals to learn from the experience or to help community members learn from experiences, or for authorities to provide processes that can help achieve these outcomes. But, just quickly, we also know that we're offering restorative processes and communities in, in all these different contexts. And it can be one-off or it can be systematic if there's a program organised. And this, to do this re relationship management, we want to be able to build maintain, deepen and repair or reset relations. So we talk about restorative practices, a range of techniques for doing that. 
So in the wake of social harm, emotional conflict persists within people, as I've mentioned, between them, within groups and between groups. You think of workplaces, you think of schools, you think of universities, residential care, out-of-home care, wherever you like. It may be sitting relations or either doing all these things, psychological and physiological, improving relationship with members of social networks. It might be uh, establishing relations with professionals, which people have mentioned already, or identify different rules for engagement. So again, we need to be clear of what the program's doing, the principles and the processes that are offering, and more than one process. What's shared across these, if you like, um, uh, areas is these group facilitated group meetings. Our, the principles of doing no further harm. These are all being distilled. There's a lot to them, um, but I'm going through it very quickly. We're working with people, uh, not doing things to them or for them, and we're setting relations right ultimately. And what do we mean by that? It's a participatory democratic set of principles, which is all of these things, participation, voice, deliberation, with skilled people doing that work. We mentioned apology before, and often people think restorative means that someone has to apologise, but what do we, there's elements to an apology, and they are these aspects. Generally, people want recognition for things that have happened. They want reasons for why the thing happened, and for a person to be able to give description to those things responsibility taken, however that might look, and accountability for the harm, some expression, whatever that is, not necessarily sorry, and a redress about rectifying the problem. We also know that there's different stages of contemplation for people facing up to wrongdoing, and we have to work with this. We might get people at the stage that I didn't do it. In the justice system, you might have it, I might have, <laughs> um, or I didn't, I didn't, but... Ultimately, we're trying to work through that so that people can get to a place where they're, they're able to say, I did. I won't go through that. This is the level of change that often we can work through, psychological, behavioural, relational and network. Story programs are gradually being developed for people uh, who don't, what, don't want to deal with the current uh, justice system. Progress is slow, not systematic. But ultimately, we need a more skilled facilitators who can offer choices and effective responses, but working across sectors. That's as, as mentioned. We already know the, the important questions now is more how and when for whom the restorative processes work that's, and how restorative process can be offered as part of an integrated justice, health and community response. So we're already doing this work, but it, we need to continue to answer these questions in different ways. I don't think I've got time for a case study. I do? Oh, OK. Wasn't sure. So uh, th this is a post-sentencing, and I'll just go very quickly, because there's generally three, but I won't be able to get through three, I don't think. See how I go? I'm, I've got, oh, OK. So this is post-sentencing. This is the, the young woman that I was mentioning who wanted to see her father. She is at school. She t tells a, a trusted teacher that something's happened. The teacher reports. The father is basically taken away from the home and goes through the justice uh, uh, the case and is convicted for some years. So her life stopped when that happened. And so when I met her, it was like, I kind of need to know what happened seven years ago. And then I need to go back and talk about why did my father um, molest me? So she had a, a series of different needs. I'll get to that. It's already been mentioned, you know, what are we doing here? It's trauma-informed work, but it's also shame-sensitive work because what we know, and there's some really good literature about the interconnection between shame and trauma, which I'm just highlighting, can't talk to. But what does um, Judith Herman talk about? Often people are struggling to tell the truth because they want to speak it, but it's unspeakable. <laughs> They're in that tension because there's been a violation to the social contract. And all, they talk about wanting safety, we're clear about that, but they're also wanting to tell a story, but we need to help construct, make sense of that story and know how they want to speak it. It's not just telling the story, it's actually being clear about how they want to tell it and what they want to hear. And then the social reconnections that people have talked about, but not just, this is with a broader community of people. With this young woman, who was now in her 20s, she wanted to meet her father in custody, as mentioned. She had no contact with him for seven years. 
at, there were, that meant that I needed to meet with the father in prison, with uh, the psychologist. It was the first time in seven years that he necessarily met with a prison psychologist. Because he was doing the restorative process, it meant that we said, well, he's, we're not working with him unless he's got support, unless he's now starting to... Because when we open this up and work with someone that's in prison to tell, well, what did happen, not just what the courts have asked you, but what you did do, and this is what your daughter wants to hear, we need to be very sensitive about the environment that that person's in because his vulnerability to go back in to, the, to his usual prison system is severe. So we have to uh, do no further harm to anybody. So we're working with everybody that's participating in, in that, with those principles. So, the, the, so all those people uh, had preparation meetings. Often the preparation meetings go longer than the group meetings. So, you know, three, four, five hours and several of them, which makes sense. The person harm recognised that there were uh, several presenting issues with other family members who never supported what had happened or didn't believe her, especially her grandparents on the father's side. So we already discussed and flagged well, you want this meeting with your father in the particular way that we're going to look at it in a minute, but she also knew that there was a whole lot of damaged relationships with her family, so we needed to build that in. So it's not just one, but many processes. Yeah. So we did that. What were her uh, desire, desired goals? To ask questions of her father, to answer some of the questions for herself, to describe what happened and, and how she'd been affected, to choose conditions for any type of relationship that she... to establish those conditions, I mean because she was not sure. She wanted to set relations right with herself, but she said, I don't know what kind of relationship I want my father. It might be where I ended. I need to see him. He needs to answer these questions. I need to make sense of something, and then I'll work it out. But I can't actually work that out beforehand. So we built in um, a break and all those sorts of things in order to do that. She had a counsellor who had been a counsellor for seven years. So she knew this that young woman very well. And the counsellor was the person who said, you know what, so talk about the ideological aspects. She said, it's no point, I'm going along with it, but I don't see that there's any point because really he's an animal and I don't see that there's any redemptive piece to him. So I won't be talking in the, in the meeting. And I said, okay, so let's just talk through how you might support this young woman. So we talked through that. As it happened in the meeting, when we were meeting in prison, that counsellor spoke a lot. <laughs> So your expectations can shift. Um, anyway, setting relations right for her was to, what she wanted to gauge the father's responses and assess whether she should have a relationship with him, whether it was going to be good for her, and that was key. Like, you don't have to have a relationship with him, right? But she did have a child and she was trying to assess, you know, if she should or not. Whether the father had changed and that whether he was willing to, to better himself. These are sort of her language. Um, the father, to, to see whether the father uh, can do what was best for her because he always seemed to be doing what was best for him and the father could be honest with himself and others. She said, oh, no. And so the counsellor thought the same. I'm just showing you this. This is the structure of the... So before we go into any meeting, there's no surprises about the process. People know what they're re revisiting. They know who's going to be in the room. And we want to always make sure that there's no surprises about the process. But there can be surprising insights that happen, and we uh, nurture those. But for her, the first thing that she wanted to do, which doesn't ne necessarily work with a narrative, because usually it goes with where the first action started and then what happened next, she said, I've got this gap in my memory, which has plagued her. I want to revisit exactly what happened on, at the moment of arrest, because that's the bit I don't know. So the father spoke first, and then we sort of ha had this order. But that's the bit about tailoring the way that we're going to revisit something, right? So that, that was something important for her. Uh, the father during the conference, and this, these are the elements of the apology that I was, had just put up before. Basically, he was able to recognise his action. There's no point of someone saying, I'm sorry, if he doesn't, they don't know what they're sorry for. It's, it's hollow and it does more damage. So he recognised his actions were selfish. He, you know, he was in a state uh, of having to, to describe in, in detail what he did because that's what she wanted. Um, 
So once we'd gone through all of, if you like, the narrative of, of the structure that I just put up, he recognised uh, that he abused his parental position, that he took advantage of the, of the situation and how uh, he abused her trust and innocence. He gave reasons for how his thoughts and feelings were twisted, spoke of his abusive patterns. He had been abused as well. But that's, it, and again, here's the shift between someone excusing something to someone, ex, uh, if, an explanation. Because she wanted to know, how come? Like, why have you become what you've become? And he said, I don't want to excuse it myself, but I'm just saying, he, she, he then t told a story, a, a few stories of what had happened for himself. He felt a sense of relief about being caught and he wanted her to know that and he had pleaded guilty. Um, he accepted responsibility for hurting and breaking her trust, breaking the parental duty of care, not stopping in the abuse. Um, and he pleaded guilty, and he, but he said, ultimately, if it wasn't for you revealing it, would I have? Uh, and uh, he couldn't answer that question. And he expressed a shame for her carrying a sense of guilt for what had happened, for not um, being... But also not just what he did, but for the, the, the lack of support that the family had given her, including friends who knew things and didn't do anything about it. And he identified what he was doing and needing to do in his life to be a different or a better person um, to help. And he knew this was going to be ongoing work. And there were people set up for him to support uh, when he uh, was released. The person harmed, the young woman said that uh, you know, her reflections were she no longer carried the burden of guilt for her father's imprisonment because she was carrying that all those years. She actually did the right thing by speaking up and stopping the abuse. First time she went, I did the right thing because for seven years she thought she hadn't because she wrecked the family. Despite what she'd suffered, uh, she will not allow the abuse to define her and that was really key for her. She didn't want that. That was that were her defining moment or moments. The discussion had provided some clarity and closure and it was a good first step for assessing her future. She wanted to move on from the past and achieve other important things in her life. All these things had been discussed in the preparation as well. She needed more time to consider the kind of connection she will have with her father. Good. <laughs> right? So the point was, you have to show me, you know, that you actually changed. So you might say it here, but that doesn't necessarily mean that's so. So upon your release, we shall meet again in a structured way, facilitated see what's happening. And she also um, received the assurance from others that she wasn't responsible for her father's action. After the conference, she thought she, this was literally walking to the car park, but then uh, afterwards, because you meet up with the person many times later, and you know, in some cases six months, a year or whatever, she thought she'd be really emotional, she'd h cry heaps, and, but to her surprise, she didn't. And she was really pleased that she participated. And basically she said, I was so prepared in a way and I so wanted to tell the things that I needed to tell and ask the questions I needed to, t I was really focused. So it was, a, it, she saw it as very positive. The counsellor, the person that was, I don't think this is a good idea, um, acknowledged there was a lot of expectation um, with the conference. She was amazed by what she saw happening as in with the young woman who she saw another side of, she said. She saw her being assertive about her needs and what she required for the future. And she said that, you know, it was a far cry from what she'd seen from the young girl she'd met who couldn't express anything um, and who was very superficial in her responses because she'd often um, disassociate, actually. And she did it once in the meeting, but then she came back because there were techniques that we talked through as to how we would help her if that was the case. And she'd witnessed change and it was quite incredible. And she said, and I witnessed change in the father and I didn't believe that he could ever change. That was something for her. And she said, my whole ideological framework slightly been challenged. That wasn't bad either. So <laughs> that's something. School, just quickly. So, you know, that's a justice setting pre-release. But then we've got, I've got you know, times in a, in a, this is primary school, high school, generally high school, and um, in universities as well. But in this case, this is a high school, two uh, young people, different accounts of an incident at a social function for which there were no witnesses. Now, I'm brought into a school. There's no program as such because the young woman said, I know I can report. 
it's all been investigated, but I need to actually meet with him because it's skewered all our relationships and I'm still sitting with one of the most harrowing moments in my life and I kind of know what, I want to know what's happened and I want to talk to him about it. So all the other reporting options were available and she took them, but she also wanted this. So again, listen to the, the needs of the person that's uh, been harmed. The parents were interviewed this, and, you know, we talked through uh, things with uh, the parents. The female student said she, had, she was pleased to have this choice, to have this meeting with the male student, and she wanted him to be able to tell the truth and apologise, and he agreed to participate because he, he acknowledged that something's happened, I was part of something, I don't agree, but, but I think we've got a different account of what's happened. That's OK. But enough to say harm's been done and I should be involved in this process. We can work with that. We re re liaised and liaised with the uh, wellbeing staff members. Again, we expand this network of support, <laughs> insight and oversight, always. Um, so the young father's, uh, the young man and the father are met. Both had been drinking heavily and there was some overlap in their recall of events but also they had significant differences. And so we needed to be able to structure it in a way that those things could be told from different set of experiences. And in the preparation, both students uh, ascertained uh, what they could or couldn't recall, what um, questions need to be a a addressed and what they hope for. We always have to set and manage expectations of what can be achieved or what can't. Anyway, so that means that when we're doing preparation, we've got to check in with that student in, or any person. So what's the worst case, best case scenario here of what can be told or what you're hoping to get out of it? If always the option's there as an alternative, if, you did, if the meeting didn't go ahead, what are other things that are going to be helpful? So the person's always got choice. Right? What relationships have been affected? What needs to be discussed? What's important to achieve? What outcomes would be beneficial? Standards? Anything that we agree to, how do we assess them? That they're okay and they can be done. You don't want to set up anyone to fail. And basically for her, she said that it was beneficial to take a stand by describing her account. She just said even if he can't say certain things that she thinks did happen and he says, oh, it didn't, this is my understanding, that I took a stance and then I'm telling him directly what I think, actually was really important for her. So there is something. She, to receive some, if it's not an apology, then it's an acknowledgement of what happened, ask questions, deliver a clear message, establish conditions for any future encounter. She wanted to feel okay back at, home, back at school and to regain a sense of strength within herself. And he wanted to provide an account of what he understood that happened, to acknowledge how the situation was, diff whatever happened, to express regret, the impact, clear the air, establish relationship for any further encounter and, and be able to move on. And basically we structured the meeting, I won't go through it because of time, and they came up with an agreement of what they would do at the school together. Ultimately, she felt better informed about the situation. There were things that they um, were able to tell each other that made sense. And they also wanted to say, well, these are the things that we've learnt. We've noticed that there's a lot of rumour mongering when these things happen in schools. We want to address that and we want to be able to work with the school in order for them to be able to approve not only the information about sexual issues but how we can have healthy sexual relationships. So there's, there was an outcome plan not only between themselves, among others, but also what the school could do. And that was... She was happy, the mother was happy, other people were happy. So that was good. <laughs> I won't go to institutional abuse, but it's, there's a, that's a whole other presentation. But in that case, it's the, what people in, in, most, in all of those schemes have identified is that we don't want to meet the person that's caused us harm. We want, we want to meet with a representative of the institution where the breach occurred in order for my story to be told and for lessons to be learned in order that there's cultural change. And that's key. So at the moment, working on the on VicPOP um, redress scheme in Victoria, we've gone through 60 cases, and you have as the reps the most senior people of the organisation all the way through, and they do training, and they're there, and there's lots to it. But I'm happy to talk about that later. But that's my time, I think. Yes. <laughs>